Welcome to the second lecture in our fall uh, lecture series with the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, Utah Chapter, and Utah Valley University. My name is Paul Monson. I am a professor at UVU and the president of the ICAA here in Utah. We are so delighted to welcome uh, David Schrant with us this evening as our lecturer. He's joining us from his home in Pittsburgh. And uh, David Schant is a principal at the award-winning firm uh, Urban Design Associates in Pittsburgh, as well as their chief illustrator. With over 30 years of practical experience as an architectural illustrator, David is truly one of the masters of his trade. I have admired his work for a long time. Uh, he seems just as comfortable with a watercolor brush in his hand as an iPad. And uh, David was very generous this afternoon in joining uh, the urban design studio we have at UVU and sharing some tips and secrets to drawing architecture, which will be the topic of his lecture for this evening. Please welcome David Schant. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. It's really nice to be here. And uh, I did want to uh, welcome everybody tonight and thanks for coming out. Um, so let's get on with it. I am David Schant. That is in fact true. Let's see here. Okay, so we're gonna start out the talk by uh, looking at four comments that uh, Paul actually sent me in presentation uh, mode for this, this topic. And uh, I, I thought they were so succinct that I wanna read them to you. And uh, drawing as a means to communicate how we perceive and understand the world around us was the first point to cover. The journey of improving one's visual communication skills through practice over time, a second item and developing 3D methods and technique for the 3D visualization of architecture, and the discovery of different media from traditional to digital. So I think as you're going through, uh, you're listening to my talk, I want you to be thinking about these ideas and how they pertain to your own story. So why draw and why is it important? Why do we, why do we still do it in the face of all the technology we're in? And more importantly, why should you draw? which is uh, a question I'm asked a lot of the time. Well, people have been drawing for a long, long time. Um, some of the earliest recorded information that we have about early man shows that they, they drew their scenario and their situation. All through history, drawing has been a medium by which communication and art flourish. Now the advancement of technology has changed a lot of this, but hasn't really taken away the, the core values of what drawing and art is. I wanted to read you this quote because I think it's very accurate. Computers allow you to make mistakes faster than any other invention in human history with the possible exceptions of handguns and tequila. So it's a tool like anything else. So this is the way we used to see our you know, um, architects and our vision of what an architect would be like is like this. But the truth of it is we're all working like this now. And here's one of the earliest laptops that uh, I ever worked on, the original PowerBook. And this is kind of what I'm working on now. So things have changed rapidly over the last, say, 30 years. I also use a, a large iPad. Sorry for the, uh, the bad uh, imagery on the screen. But I also now work on a 32-inch Cintiq where the drawing goes directly into the computer from my hand. You, Many of you are also familiar with the iPad, which is uh, revolutionized the way people draw without paper and the pencil. Um, so drawing can be translated into all new mediums and new technology. But I want you to remember back because as kids, we all drew, we all drew. And we drew pictures like this. And these pictures were descriptive. They were interesting. They were understandable. And as children, they were our means to communicate. Now you have to remember that as a child, between the age of say two and 10, you know, your, your primary method of, of, of 
of, of communicating was either by speech or by drawing because you hadn't really learned to read yet. The written word was still not completely decipherable to you. So drawings like this told your story and it told you, told people about the world that you looked at and how you looked at it. And it could be very simple. It could be very direct. It could tell the story exactly. In fact, you know, I've got, I've got two kids and my daughter, Caroline, this is her. She used to draw like this. Now this is one of her drawings. I think this was done when she was about four and it's three birds sitting on a tree branch and you know exactly what it is. You know exactly how she feels about this thing. Here's another one. This was, this was her idea of a ladybug. You know, it's a lady and it's a bug, you know? So it's very descriptive. It's very interesting. This is what she looks like now. So she's not drawing like that anymore. So she's grown up, but to see it was interesting. Now we all, you know, at this age are drawing like this. And then somewhere around the age of 10 years old, we start to develop inhibitions about drawing because we can't, we, we, we look at the world that we want to communicate and we want to draw and we fall short in our skill set. And that's the point at which many people either seek out more information and continue to draw and maybe continue to develop their artistic skills or they let it go and it's replaced by, by the written word. So the objective of, of making art isn't to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. So you wanna be in the place, you wanna be in the zone to do art. So as you got a little bit older, art became important to you. So my story is a little bit uh, different but similar in a lot of ways to many people. I started out in uh, you know, my younger years watching things like this and developing uh, um, interests in things like Star Wars and comic books. I loved comic books because there was a whole visual world in there that was drawn. And I, was, I thought that was very interesting. And I always was the kid that was doodling and was sitting in the back of the classroom, probably not paying as much attention to everything else as I should have. So what I gathered out of comics, though, was my favorite thing about it was I loved the fact that they drew all aspects of the world that they were, in, you know, that the, the, the characters were in. So up around 15 years old, I found this book in a bookstore. And you got to remember back then there was no Internet. So you wandered into a bookstore, you found a book, you know, it was just by happenstance. You know, the, the likelihood was was not as great as it is now. You couldn't have anything you just wanted. And this book changed pretty much my whole trajectory of, of art. It's called Drawing with Pen and Ink, and it's by a gentleman named Arthur Guptill, and it was written in the 1920s during sort of the golden age of architectural illustration. And inside the book was filled, it was filled with, with drawings like this one. In fact, this one was the one that captivated me the most. I couldn't believe that anyone could draw that well. Like it just, just blew my mind. The detail was unbelievable. The stroke was so controlled that the accuracy was all just there and it just made me excited. And this book was filled with all these examples and information about all these different artists that I had never heard about. So I started to explore. And it also was filled with all these, it was like a how-to manual on how to use um, compositional elements, how to use light and dark. And Guptil, he, do all, he did all these drawings. So he went through the entire sort of process of architectural rendering, doing everything from windows to full houses and plans, everything. So it was a wonderful book. In fact, I believe it's still in print. It's in its like 11th or 12th printing. So it's something you should look for. And it also had some of the great architectural illustrators of the period, like Bertram Goodhue. And um, yeah, this is Kenneth Conant. And um, just wonderful stuff. And then other artists started to enter into my vocabulary, guys like Edward Hopper and Andrew Wyeth and Fairfield Porter and Winslow Homer. And, uh, you know, Hopper had this distinctive way of looking at the architectural built world that I loved. And the flat color was very interesting to me. And the, 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 the angles of his views were not always what you would expect. And the, the, the cropping in his images was so, it was so modern at the time. And I just loved the way these images looked and they were watercolor, which also interested me. And then Andrew Wyeth was, Probably, is probably my most famous favorite artist. And he just looked at the world in a completely different way. Um, you could look at these images and you can tell they're buildings, but they're actually very modern paintings. The, the, the stroke and the, the mechanism by which they're done is completely out of bounds with the way normal watercolors were done. 
Here's another one of his watercolors, which I love the scumbling and the use of color in these paintings. They're absolutely beautiful. The palette is just very interesting, very difficult to even get close to the mastery that he has. And this is Fairfield Porter. And Porter, you probably haven't ever heard of, but he, he was able to do these incredible paintings with, with no lines at all just these pure chunks of color, but they still evoked an incredible sort of feeling in the viewer. And of course, Winslow Homer was probably the greatest watercolorist that America ever produced. You look at this painting and I've seen it in the galleries. It's, it's as beautiful today as it, as it was back then. The colors are just absolutely incredible. And then there was contemporary watercolorists like John Pike and Charles Reed and Randolph By. And here's, here's John Pike. And, he also worked in the movie industry, and you can tell a little bit by these images that, that he, was, he was drawn to these dramatic sort of scenes with very strong foreground, middle ground, and background characteristics, which is something that you'll see in my, later, in, in my work later on. And this is Charles Reed. And again, like, like Hopper, his, his view of the world was different, and his, his use of light and shadow was absolutely incredible. He's kind of like a combination between uh, Porter and, um, and Hopper. And Randolph By from Philadelphia did this amazing sort of stone and uh, fall Lancaster County paintings of, of beautiful architecture. So these guys were very influential. And I, I started to study into who these people were and how they rendered and how they painted. And then of course, the renderers of that period that I looked at, Arthur Guptill, who we talked about, uh, Ted Kotsky, who uh, was an amazing illustrator and painter. This is Arthur Guptill, and this is from the color drawing book that he also produced, which goes into every aspect of how to use color in your renderings and how to silhouette trees and how to figure things out. It was a wonderful thing. Here's the tree. This is the best page in the whole book, how to draw trees, which very few people know how to do. So this is a great one to look up. And then uh, Helmut Jacoby, who was a, a, an illustrator in the 1960s and uh, the first studio I worked in, uh, the, um, the guy I worked for was actually a student of his and did work very similar to this. So my earliest architectural rendering career was filled with drawings like this. So we have 10,000 bad drawings in us and sooner or later, we get them out of ourselves the better, which is a great quote because it's gonna take you some time to get better at drawing. It's a, it's a learned skill, it's, it needs practice just like playing an instrument. So you need to, you need to keep at it and you need to, have, you know, the journey is gonna be long, but it's gonna be fruitful. So, you know, when I got to about uh, 18 years of age, I started to think about whether I wanted this to be, I wanted to be a professional in this field or whether I just wanted to keep it at amateur status and be, you know, make it a personal thing. So I decided to go the professional route. And to do that, you need to, you need to figure out a system by which you can be uh, an illustrator. It's not just it's not just painting for enjoyment. It's it's painting under a deadline and a schedule and under a fixed budget. So um, I started working in illustration studios. Um, my first one out of school, I apprenticed with an architectural illustrator um, who was very famous. Who worked? Uh, he was originally from Florida, and he had moved up to Buffalo, New York, where I had gone to school. And uh, for whatever reason, he was looking for an apprentice. So I went in. And I knew nothing about how to really work in architecture because my background was in fine art. Um, I had degrees in design and art history. And I had a, at that time, I had no master's degree yet, but I ultimately got a master's degree in fine art. So my architectural experience was very minimal. I had loved to always draw architecture, but didn't know the mechanics by which to get a, a set of plan drawings into a drawing and show what it would look like when it was built. So this system of moving through these blocks of idea to concept sketch. And then back then it was, it was a hand constructed perspective. Now we do digital models, but back then we did everything in plan projection by hand. And then a preliminary Photoshop layout. Back then it used to be a preliminary hand drawing that showed what every aspect of the thing was gonna look like. Then the, the final preliminary, then the final drawing, and then the final coloring. And back then it was watercolor or it was airbrush. And now it's Photoshop or digital render. So drawing the drawing is, my, my background has always been as a linear uh, black and white line-based illustrator. I love to
to create the form of architecture in line. It's where I'm the most comfortable. Um, I feel that if I work it out in line, I can see it clearly in color and I can see it on the screen and I can see where it needs to go. So a drawing like this, which is a freehand form over a SketchUp model, shows the kind of characteristics of my work and the, the way I handle trees and, uh, and, and location of things. I love the, the versatility of hand sketching. I love the quickness of it. I love the efficiency of it. I love the ability to be able to do this in front of people. That's one of the reasons I love drawing is because it's a communication skill that everybody understands and acknowledges. And these quick sketches can communicate lots of information and lots of ideas, which I like. So many of us, you know, we today we don't do plan projection anymore. We work from SketchUp or we work from other programs such as Revit. But in my world, you know, building SketchUp models um, was and, and creating perspective out of that was really the building, the starting point for my drawings. And then I would I would start to figure out what compositional elements I might need, whether I want to push the foreground or push the background or have lead ins to the drawing or shadow patterns. I would always do these quick little sketches, these thumbnails by hand, and I still do very often. And then I would do uh, quick tonal sketches to see what the light patterns might be. Uh, this this two shaded one uh, uh, is very indicative of some of my older work. So my workflow process today is very similar to the way it was before, but now you know with the advent of uh, Google Earth and digital photography, you can you can quickly move from the the real world to the drawn world. So here's an example of a photograph, a pan photograph that was taken of a site um, that I needed to draw into location. So this was the SketchUp model that I constructed with some pre-built architecture. Now, I must, I must uh, go back and say that a lot of the drawing work that I do in the design process is very, very early. Um, UDA specializes in uh, charrette-based work and, and development visioning at, a, at, a, at an early degree in architectural and uh, urban design projects. So a lot of times, the drawing that I'm doing is the first real glimpse that somebody gets at what their project really looks like and what it could look like and what it could be. So I have to be, you know, I have to, I have to treat that with the, with the responsibility that it, that it deserves and make sure that what I'm drawing and what I'm, you know, what I'm creating is in the realm of what it needs to be. So in this case, these buildings, you know, and I'll be having a conversation with the, uh, with the team while we're going through this about what these various components might be and where the building locations might be. There's a plan or a quick sketch plan that might develop this. And then, I go into the drawing and I add um, people and entourage. And uh, in, in quick sketches like this one, I add just as, as much as I need. Um, in, in recent times, I, I, I've been adding um, PNG clip files of people, which you can get off the internet at all different kinds of places. And you can take these directly into Photoshop. Um, and it's great because in the old days, you used to have to construct and draw all these things or trace them all off of photography that you took. So you don't have to really do that anymore. And then the hand drawing, which you can see, I've got one person that I've eradicated here. Um, this is the sketch that pulls all that information together. It ties the, 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 the preliminary digital view and the, the character and the people and the softness of the drawing all come together in this. Then the last thing, whoop, and we're gonna, I, hold on to your seats. I'm gonna have to show you the other piece later as we get down the road. I'm not sure where the last piece went. But here's another example of that in aerial form where we're working from a SketchUp model. This is uh, the diagramming that went from, uh, from one of my team guys saying what he was looking for. And each one of these was keyed to a photograph like this, where he'd say, okay, well, I want this building to be like this one and this one like this one, or this one might be like this. And then here's the hand drawing with all that put back in and all the entourage laid into it. And then this is the final color view the color finished off in um, in Photoshop with filters and uh, and all the the necessary uh, color choices. So drawing architecture versus drawing urban design. Well, drawing architecture is is a bit different than drawing urban urban design. Um, architecture is 
in, in, in many instances, you're looking at the, the, the specific details of maybe one building or a couple of buildings, where in urban design, you're drawing the built environment, you're drawing the world and the context that things sit in, the activities that happen, the, the, the atmosphere, the mood, the character, the trees, the landscape, everything synthesized into a drawing that evokes how a place might be used. So a drawing like this gives you a snapshot of what a project in Scotland might be like. Um, you know, what it might feel like to walk along that street in the late afternoon during the, the during the, you know, the, the fall of the year when the shadows start getting long. Or, you know, it could be a residential view where, you know, there's a neighborhood garden in between these houses and what's happening in there and how's everything going. Or it might be late afternoon on a street that uh, everybody's getting off work and uh, the sidewalks are activated and the buildings are shaded um, or in this natural glow of the, of the afternoon. So your job as the illustrator is to bring all this stuff together, take all the pieces of the project that you've heard of and seen and synthesize it into something that tells this story. And it's usually a number of drawings that does this. So my original, the, the, the original earlier work that I used to do was all traditional illustration, which means that the drawing was done by hand, the painting was done by hand, everything was done by hand. And um, this quote's very succinct, that drawing makes you see things clearer and clearer and clearer still. The image is passing through you in a physiological way, in your brain, in your memory, where it stays, it's transmitted by into your hands, which is, that's exactly what happens when you draw. It's a different kind of memory, it's a different kind of form. And the more you do it, the more you become attuned to the world around you and the way you interpret that. So, you know, what? So, for example, this is a this is an aerial rendering of all of Seattle and the uh, the ultimate hundred year built out of Seattle. So, in a drawing like this, all these projects that were going to be done in the next fifty to one hundred years had to be synthesized into what this drawing was. Now, this was all done by hand. There was no digital base for this whatsoever. So it was quite a job, and this would have taken, you know. This is probably two weeks worth of work. Here's, a, here's an aerial view of Seaside. You guys may have seen this on the, on the big Seaside book that came out a few years ago. You know, what it felt like to, see, to be above that and, and the softness of watercolor really gives you the, the mood and character of the place. Or this project out in Calgary, um, sitting at the, the foot of the Three Sisters Mountains, you know, and mimicking and heralding what a, what a, a mountain town in, in the Alps might feel like out that way. And, you know, I, I found a love of painting and doing these things. Painting was not something that I learned in college. I, I learned how to do it in the, in the various studios I worked in. And it took a long time to sort of figure out what painting was really about because I had never really taken any formal classes. So I kept at it. I kept working at it and seeing where it was going to lead. Of course, I had the benefit of being able to draw and paint every day at work. So things came smoothly and quickly. So later on, you know, paintings like this became something that I could do, something that I could achieve. And I kept at it. Or this one, where you're looking over the mountains in Western Virginia at these houses sit sitting atop the mountainside. Or this one, which was done fairly recently, which is a very sketchy view um, in Carlsbad, California, of what it might feel like along the street. And I actually have to say that that digital media for me hasn't really replaced this. It's become a quicker alternative, but I still love the way these things feel and how they fit together and what they mean. Um, they, they're art for art's sake. They're not just renderings. And the, the ability to, to render like this is still something that people really, really love and it resonates with people. Because you can, you can look at this and you can infer sort of meaning within this without being caught up in the detail of what it is. You can feel yourself in that street. Your mind fills in the blanks of what's around it and what's gonna, what, what it's going to be. Uh, pencil sketches were another thing I love to do, these tonal views. And I love to characterize the landscape with pencil. It was a wonderful thing to, and I still do it all the time. I just don't do much of it anymore for uh, production work. And colored pencil was, uh, was a very popular medium for a long time. And I love the rapidity and the and the strength of a drawing like this. It's got a lot of motion in it. 
And um, you know, you would put this up on the screen. It had the it had the gesture of just being created, which was great in the Chevrat environment. And you know, I I do this in black and white or in color. And then uh, you know, quick value studies that harken back to that Guptill book on how foreground, middle ground, and background could read in a in an architectural sketch. Here's another view from Carlsbad, you know, and the people, you know, it's not realism. It's 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 a different thing altogether, but it tells the story of how a place might be, and it sets a mood and character for what it might be. Here's another one, and the dappled sunlight in this falling across all these buildings, and how how would that feel to be in you know in South Carolina during a day in the afternoon and live in this space, remembering that this doesn't exist at the time, so you're creating this environment, kind of like the comic books we talked about. So then I ended up getting into hybrid illustration, which is sort of a mixture of traditional media and digital media. And as, as the Wacom pad came along and Photoshop started to develop, um, this became what we, we headed towards in the studio because it took much less time to finish images. So an image like this, which is all the color in this is digital. There's no, there is no um, traditional media in this whatsoever. There is a line base way underneath it, but it's by virtue a, a, a digital image or things like this, where you can see those PNJ people files underneath, but the character of the architecture and the color harkens to what the watercolors look like. It doesn't hold quite the weight that it did, but it does have quite a bit of the same feeling. And this would take a quarter of the time that one of those paintings would take. Stuff like this, where the activities and the, and the mood and character of the place really resonate, the time of day, um, what's going on, you know, early evening. And I loved, I loved to do trees and I love to put them in front of architecture and around architecture. Don't feel like the trees can't block part of the view. Don't feel like the people can't block part of the view. They are part of the context of the world. And if you take them out and you just isolate the architecture, it doesn't read the same way. There's another example. So I've done lots of these. I've done, is it reality? No. It's 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 not even it's it's a it's a it's a cooked version of the way I think things should look, which is a good way. You know, it's the style that I've created over the over the years. But there's a there's a strength and power to it that leads all the way back to those those influences that I told you about early on. And I love the idea of being able to put one of these images together and put it in front of the client and see what they discover in this, see the parts of it that they told me about, see the the buildings that are there see the buildings that are going to be there. All that stuff comes together. That's the, that's the fun about being an illustrator. And every place is different. Every place has a character and a context that you can decipher as an artist. Um, the longer you look at things, the more you understand about how the world goes together and the more you can fit it in. And a lot of these sketches, the quick ones, they really get close to the, to the painting style that I have. We're going to go through these a little quicker because there's quite a few of them. So but evening, evening scenes are very easy to do now with, with digital media. And the influence of light and character is, is something that I love to work with. So digital shots like this are so much fun to do. And they give you a whole other set of meaning around how a building or how a, an environment will look at different times of the day. You know, it's, it, it, it would not be as exciting to look at, I'm afraid, during the daytime as it is at night sometimes. Here's another example of, um, of a grove of trees that the whole focus is how these trees would react um, in daytime and evening in this square um, in Norfolk. Nighttime views with water, Christmas time in Jacksonville, Florida, you know. You never know where you're going to draw next. And with UDA, we've done projects all over the world. So I get a chance to do drawings and understand what I, you know, where I'm headed with all this. I've done over 10,000 illustrations for UDA since I started 20 years ago. And um, every one of them I come to in a new way. Um, here's another example. Now this one, oops, sorry. We're jumping around because my mouse is a little, let's go back. Whoop. I don't know why it's doing this, but. There we go. Okay. so. I showed you that that image of Seattle. Now this is Norfolk, and this is this is all of Norfolk, every aspect of it. And this was 
hand drawn over a digital base, and then Google Earth was used to fill in some of the color and hybridize. Here's another example of an aerial view that uses Google Earth in the background to fill in. So you get used to now with these these new uh, these new tech technological pieces, they add to your work in a lot of ways. Here's that one we looked at before that was part of that drawing suite. And you know, I do a lot of sketchy things too, real quick. You know, this is like an hour drawing with a little bit of color thrown on it. It doesn't have the texture and the reality of the other stuff, but it's very effective. And you know, you do a series of these, it tells the story of a place very easily, very well. You know, every neighborhood is full of, of, of different people and different character. And this is a drawing in which we were doing a charrette down in, uh, in Virginia. And I actually took photographs of the people that lived there that were, in the, that were at the charrette, and I put them right into the renderings. And this resonated very well with the neighborhood. What would be better than you having your new neighborhood and you being in it? So there's lots of these drawings. Over the years, they could, they could show every different kind of architectural style different places, different characters, big things, small things. This is an aerial uh, of uh, the new amphitheater in, uh, in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and a series of shots that was done of that amphitheater. Now, these are also early on in the design process, but you can see what kind of accuracy and, and character you can get into these drawings that tells the story of the place. This would not have been possible years ago doing by hand. This was all done in a week's time, all these drawings. And um, they really tell the story. So we also do a lot of pure digital illustration, but we still start at the same area. Now this is a project that we were working on in Saudi Arabia. And um, we, we actually cartooned it out. We did a storyboard of quick sketches of which direction we wanted the, the digital uh, modeling to go because you don't want to spend and invest too much time in digital modeling if it's not the right direction. So it's still good to draw these places and get a, a quick character of what they might feel like. And so like a drawing, a character sketch like this, which starts to map out some of the architecture, quickly becomes a more refined sketch with color. Then it gets the first example of modeling. Then it's finished as a rendering. And this is, this is a, 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 a colorized version um, with Photoshop uh, After Effects put on it of the, of the model. Because you can see the model's a little stale. You know, it's a, it's a Lumion model and it's good. It's very good, but it doesn't have the, the mood and character that you can get into something like this. And where did I get that idea? Well, there was an artist named Maxfield Parrish who was a famous illustrator at the turn of the century. I mean, this guy was, he was really famous and he did these amazing paintings. And I remembered this color style and it, it, it's very beautiful. These were oil paintings, but they look like photo, they're like photographically painted. It's unbelievable. And the color and quality of these, I just thought would work really well in drawings like this. So if you have something like this, which is a pure digital model, and then you add that color and character into it, you can get this, this mood and feeling of what it might le like be, likely be to be on the edge of the desert and have this oasis coming up in front of you. And we did a whole series of these where there was 35 drawings done for this. And they were every aspect of the design and the character of the place. From And here's another example of the Lumion model and what you would do to it to add color and variation. I'm gonna go through these there quick, but they show how that, that color palette influenced all this work. Okay, so I'm not the only one in the studio that does uh, illustration work. And uh, uh, our other modeler, Jeffrey Schweiger, um, does a lot of uh, illustration work as well. Um, his stuff is pure digital though. And this is, this is an example of something that might come straight out of SketchUp. Although the trees which are, are grafted in here are actually my trees that were taken off the old paintings. And these are effective, they, they, they have a, you know, they have a beauty to them. And you guys might be familiar with architectural renderings like this. These are done in Lumion and they're absolutely beautiful. I love, I love the way they, they make a project feel real. They, they, have a, they have an accuracy and a detail to them that's hard to match. But my heart still goes back to this kind of stuff. I hate to say it, but I love the, I love the mood and the drive and the, the power that's in a drawing like this. 
or like this. So very often, these are the ones that come first before we do anything that goes down that road. Okay, so like we were talking about at the beginning, what are the, some of the things you can do to advance your skills? Well, one of the first things you can do is draw every day. In, in my case, you can draw 10 to 15 hours a day. That'll make you get really good fast. You do that for 30 years, you'll, you'll be fine. It'll, it'll work out for you, I promise. But one of the quick things you can do is keep a sketchbook. Now, I, I keep a variety of different sketchbooks. One of them is watercolors. And how I got better at painting was by painting. That's how you get better at anything. You do it. You don't think about it. You just do it. Now, you can get any kind of sketchbook. There's all different kinds that you can try. They're, the sky is the limit. And I know because I have lots and lots of them. And I love the idea of, of taking notes and testing out little ideas in my mind. I do a lot of these little sketches. Now, they don't have anything to do with the kind of work I do at work, but they, they keep my mind stimulated for the direction that I want my art to ultimately go. Or they may be something that I cut out of a a magazine or something and you know try to see what that character i save all this stuff because they lead to things later on so sketches like this that i might do or this that i might do or this that i might do might lead to that see so there's the sketch and that's probably you can see my fingers in there very tiny but to invest the time and get this out of it this is this is this is what i love about art is that it can take you down this rabbit hole that keeps going and going so there's all kinds of guys that do this. This is a, this is a guy named uh, Nicholas Sanchez. And believe it or not, he does these drawings just with a ballpoint pen. He uses one of these multi-tip colored ballpoint pens. And this is what he's able to do. It's unbelievable. And you know, you don't have to be the greatest at drawing to have fun with your sketchbook. It's really a personal journey and it's where you keep all your notes and your ideas. There's mine again. So. This is another person that I, I love. Um, and I love working on tonal papers too, like this. You can see you're testing your palette and putting notes down here. It's a great thing. It, and you know, to refer back to this as opposed to looking at a photograph on your phone, you, your visual memory will remember the aspects of this because you've, you've spent the time to really look at what you're drawing. Now, watercolor, you know, the sky's the limit with what you can use for watercolor too. And you know, this is this is kind of what my palette looks like all the time. It's not clean, fancy stuff. It's just stuff that works. And again, you could get a variety of inexpensive to more expensive things. Uh, the better you get, the more the quality equipment you need. But you can start with just the basics, just a few things. And you can start and, you know, you could look at something like this and you can start to translate it into painting. You know, but it takes time and it takes understanding. You're not going to be good at it at first, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's about how you feel. And I guarantee you, if you do things like this, you'll go back again and again, and you'll look at that painting and you'll remember what it felt like to put that color down. So you want to have an artistic goal. You want to know that your work is going somewhere. I mean, why do all this if you're not going to get anything out of it, right? So my artistic goal a bunch of years ago was to get better at watercolor. You know, I did it at the office, but I had no other outlet. I had no other way to get the artistic part out of me other than just doing commercial work. So I started doing plein air, which is outdoor painting. And I found that it was very different than the work that I did in the office. It was, it took much less time. I couldn't use the same materials. I couldn't use the same equipment. It had to be portable. I was outside, so I had to deal with the elements. But after a while, I started to really understand and like what I did because there's nothing like standing in front of an object and rendering it, drawing it, or painting it. You get so much more out of it than you would if you photographed it or you just walked by it and, and, and noticed it. You know, this is deep. Every painting that I do is deeply embedded in my, my visual memory. So a place like this, you know, and this work makes it back into my professional work as well. The idea of this street and this character and this light, which I could really explore in a painting, a, a traditional painting, can also make it back into the other stuff. So I do a lot of this and I've been doing plein air competitions now for the last 10 years or so. In fact, here's, here's an example of a week's worth of work down in plein air Easton on the Eastern shore a couple of years ago. So these were all done within a week and framed and put up into the competition. There's a happy guy. There's one of the paintings. And see it creeped back into our work at UDA as well. So 
taking the character of a piece of legacy property and explaining it through paint really resonated with our clients because the memory that they had um, got embedded into these, these paintings and drawings that I did. So we still do this very often for projects. And, you know, it, it, it adds another dimension to the way you look at land and you look at property. So here's an example. I was just at Plenty of East in this year painting. And so I started with this. This all happened within a three hour period. So here I am at a beautiful estate on the Eastern shore. I do a quick sketch like this on my sketch pad. I start blocking in colors and here's the painting. And there it is on the easel. And off it goes to the new owner, which I love. So you guys can also, you don't have to go do competitions and plein air events, but Urban Sketchers is a great, great way, or just painting outside is a great way to, to up your skills. Here's Mark Taro Holmes, who's one of the most famous of the plein air sketchers. And I love the fluidity and drawing aspect and the painting quality of his work. It's just gorgeous. Um, and he's very, very quick and efficient at this. Here's another example of some really great work. So there's lots of books out there that you can look at. And there's lots of stuff online that you can look at videos and all these things that didn't exist when I was younger. Um, so you can really learn quickly and get a good understanding of how all this works. And if you wanna work on the iPad, when you're out there, it's it, just go ahead and try it. it. It's a great way to do things. And start filling up that sketchbook, which that's really, that's really where, the, where the, 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 the reality begins for you. So go on your own journey, right? That's what you wanna do. So here's an example of somebody at my office who I really find great. Her name is Rebecca Lefkowitz, okay? So, so she went to school and she had, was exposed to a little bit of drawing, but not very much. So when she got to Carnegie Mellon in her master's program, she decided she wanted to, uh, to um, learn more about drawing. So we entered this, uh, this uh, traveling prize competition and she actually won it. And before this, she had never really done any real drawing. So she started out doing stuff like this, which quickly evolved into things like this. Now, this is what happens when you draw intensively. You know, she was drawing every day, four or five hours a day. So you start to really get a rhythm. Now she's on site doing these drawings over in Europe. So it was a, it was a month long excursion that she took where she could totally immerse herself in drawing. So when she got back and she, uh, we immediately hired her at UDA because I don't see people that, that develop drawing skills like this very often. So I, you know, I found she was a kindred spirit and would do great at UDA. So she works there now, but, and this is what I think about, which is very interesting. So during the pandemic, right? We all had a year or a year and a half where we're pretty much faced with doing whatever we got to do. So she decides she wants to learn how to paint, right? So over the course of a year and two months, she does 350 paintings, okay? All of them exploring the idea of color and watercolor and working to her assets. She was good at pencil drawing. So she used that and she came up with this whole world of drawings that she could do from different angles and different things. And so she's really, that's what it takes sometimes to get over that hump to understand how to draw and paint. You gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta be, expose yourself to it. So what I've learned over 30 years well, I've learned that, uh, you know, visual learning is visual memory and drawing comes easy to some people. You know, you always hear people say, oh, he's gifted or she's gifted. Well, what's not, they're not gifted as artists. What they're gifted with is an eye for drawing. They can, they can, they can automatically see how proportion and line goes together, but you can learn. Drawing is a, is a learned skill. So as you develop your own visual memory, you will get better at drawing. Tracing is not cheating, guys. The best way to learn how to draw is to trace other people's drawings or trace photographs because you're deciphering a world of, of complicated information and you have, to, you have to pare it down to what, it, what its essence is. And the only way to do that is to practice going over it by line. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice, you keep drawing, you keep drawing, you keep drawing. You create a workflow. You, you do things consistently. So if you did it one way and it worked that way, do it again that way. Keep pushing things forward. Do what motivates you and do what you love. Okay, so if you, if you love a certain aspect of drawing or painting, that's what you focus on. That's what you do. That's how you start. 
And where do you find inspiration? There's inspiration everywhere today. It's, on, it's online, it's outside, it's in galleries. You could never be more exposed to the world around you than you are right now. So you should be thankful for that. Here's, here's the most important piece. Protect the parts of, the, of, of what you do. Don't let go of those. Like I said earlier, I love the line version. I love the drawing by line. I never get rid of that in my work. Even as digital as I ever get, I'm never going to get rid of that aspect of the way I draw. And share what you know. Share it with others and let them know what you know. It's, it's never a bad thing to let other people see how excited you are about what you do. Nothing is going to stay the same. You're going to be moving forward. Technology moves forward. The world moves forward. But you're going to find your own way. That's the end. Thank you so much, David. That sure. was a wonderful journey through your uh, development of your talent and different uh, media that you work in and ideas and techniques and, and, and tips for all of us. I, I think it's safe to say that uh, UDA would, would not be what we think of uh, without David Shant. And we're so grateful for you uh, sharing your, your gifts and your uh, advice and expertise with us. Uh, fantastic. We, we encourage everyone to uh, go ahead and uh, type some questions into the chat. If you'd like to ask David a, a question, we've got a few minutes that we can do a, a Q&A with him. Uh, we've got some questions coming in already. And also remind everyone that this class qualifies for AIA continuing education credits. If you're one of those that needs AIA credits, uh, send your AIA number to alyssa.felix at classassistutah.org and you can get credit for this class. Um, let's jump right in with uh, some questions. I, I had a question that I wanted to, to start out with was uh, you mentioned a couple of times the idea of a uh, charrette, kind of yes. a charrette process, and that's probably a new word for some of our students. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that quickly, uh, sure. what, what that means. A charrette is a, a gathering, an intensive drawing session where you, um, you get together with um, all the active participants in a project, um, usually on location, and you all work on uh, um, perfecting and directing the design ideas towards completion. And it could be with uh, municipalities, it could be with private developers, and my job is to synthesize that stuff into drawing. So everybody's working together to get all this done, which is a lot of fun. And you take all your equipment with you and you set up shop and, and it's, it's, it's very exciting. And it's, it's a, it's an intensive process, but it's a very rewarding one. Wonderful. Uh, a couple of like uh, technical questions that people are asking about uh, watercolor pencils and uh, ink pens that you can use with watercolor that won't run. Sure, Do you have sure. any advice on, uh, I guess, just your your tools, your materials sure, sure. that you could share? Well, there are um, uh, watercolor pencils are great, um, um, although they do. I, I would recommend just getting a simple little watercolor set that you could use as opposed to the pencils, because it actually takes more effort to push that that color around in, in watercolor pencils than it actually does to just throw a little paint down. Um, try them both and see what you think. You know, you don't have to buy a whole set of them. You can just get a couple of colors and give them a try. Um, and waterproof pens, you know, it's funny that the entire journey along my way, there's been great pens and pencils that I've been able to use. Um, uh, the best ones that work on watercolor paper, though, are probably the, the Micron series, um, uh, which they make the, uh, the gray-barreled, uh, completely waterproof one, and they also make the white-barreled version, which I'm, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with. That's probably the best pen to draw with on watercolor paper. Although lately, most of my drawings, the expressive ones that I'm doing, I actually use a basic flare pen. That's kind of my favorite pen right now, believe it or not, which is probably the least expensive pen you can buy, but you can get a very expressive line with it. I love I love having that, that fluidity of line that you can get on paper. So do you, do you use multiple uh, line weights, multiple thicknesses of pens? Or do you um, I, I don't typically when I do a drawing, I usually use one line weight. Um, I used to use multiple line weights years ago, but have since uh, 
I can get the character of the line to change with the pen now that I use it, uh, the ones that I use for, uh, especially for freehand drawing. But okay. don't, don't, uh, don't let that deter you because if you're an architect and you're familiar with drafting, then you're familiar with line weights. And I, you know, I encourage you to, to, to draw in the style that makes you comfortable. Uh, you mentioned a couple of, of books during your presentation. Uh, would you mind just uh, repeating some of those, the key, key books? Uh, sure. We um, have a question about that. The first, the first one is that, uh, that early version of drawing with pen and ink, which is by Arthur Guptill, G-U-P-T-I-L-L. -L. Um, and as I mentioned, he wrote a series of books. He wrote, he wrote that one. He wrote one called uh, Color Drawing, which is uh, the color version, the watercolor and pencil version of, um, of the same sort of treatise. And then there's a pencil version that's, uh, that's uh, I think it's called uh, Rendering in Pencil. Um, so if you look up Arthur Guptill, any of his books, and the earlier ones are better than the later ones. Um, there's also, there's a var wide variety um, of, of I actually, I have a bio bibliography that I could forward to you that you could, you could send out to everybody that's interested that has a whole list of the kind of books that I went through that are still in print that uh, are available. So I can, I can make that available to you guys. That would be amazing. We love that. We could share sure. that with all of our, uh, our viewers. Thank Great. you. Okay. Uh, maybe one last question, just, uh, you, you know, how do you get a job in the industry like you have? Are there <laughs> are there any other David Shantz out there uh, that do what you do? Well, I got to tell you, um, I'm the luckiest guy there probably is because I get this <laughs> consistent flow of drawings that I get to work on. Yeah. I love to draw. I mean, it's like the one thing that I do really, really well. Yeah. And so to have found a place where not just the things that I think about drawing wise, but the other things that I'm interested in all come together into one career. Now, you know, not everybody gets an opportunity to do that. I'm, I'm very thankful that things have worked out the way they have. Um, but I, I've, I've been finding out that you could create your own destiny a lot of ways too. Like if you, if you have something that you really love to do, you should just keep pushing it and doing it because sooner or later, everybody else you're competing against, if they don't have the fortitude that you do, they won't make it and you'll be there. So, you know, <laughs> it took me, and I, here's, here's, a, here's a good story. The first guy that I worked for, he was a really great illustrator. He was a complete lunatic. He had been married four times before he was 40. I mean, he was, he was a basket case, but he said this one thing to me the first day I started there and I sat down and I was going like a house of fire. I'm trying to take notes and do all this stuff. And he goes, he goes, you got to slow down. He said, you are not going to get better at this for at least 10 years. And he was absolutely right. It took 10 years and thousands of drawings to get better. And if you just, if you're patient and you keep moving forward, you're going to get somewhere. And ultimately you'll end up doing at least a piece of what you love to do, you know? And, um, you know, the, the other benefit is I, I love to, uh, I love to teach. And at UDA, we've had the opportunity to, to, to work with a lot of really amazing artists and people. In fact, our company was, was founded by a, an artist architect out of uh, South Africa. And some of the guys that I've worked with over the years, I mean, um, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Joe Skiba, who's a, a great illustrator out there in the field now, and uh, JJ Zanetta. These guys, you know, they 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 continue on the the process and the and the quality of traditional media that comes out and digital media that's moving forward. So no, there's 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 room out there. You just have to find your place. Yeah, thank you. I have that advice to be patient with yourself. It's got to yeah. be one of the hardest things in our in our modern <laughs> world, but it's so important. It absolutely uh, is to uh, give yourself time to improve and and take the time to to draw and to paint every day. Fantastic! We want to thank David Shant for joining us this evening. This has been the uh, lecture with the Utah Valley University and uh, ICAA Utah chapter. We want to thank. Uh, our sponsors, especially FFKR Architects, who is a great supporter of the ICAA here in Utah, and uh, all of our students at UVU for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. We'll see you. See ya.